Okay. Now, I did, uh, I did tell you in the excitement that you had of uh, preparing for midterm, don't forget to buy the book for today. How many of you forgot? One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, so you guys are going to need to catch up um, on, the, on the reading um, for, from today. Okay. So our second book, right? And I know at this moment, those of you who've read today, are going, I'm so confused. I don't know who these characters are. I don't know what's happening, right? That's because that always happens at every book that you begin, right? Right? So when we began Atonement, you're like, who's this Bryony character? Who's Cecilia? What's, what's Robbie? What? Right? Those sorts of questions we have because we're not used to these characters yet. Right? We don't know what's happening. We're just getting used to seeing who these people are and what they're doing and what time they're living in and all those sorts of things about them. Right? So just be a little bit patient when you start out this book because at first you're going to be a little bit confused. But just, I, I, I think once we... Uh, like lay down the, the three main narrative threads, the three stories that make up this novel in our discussion today, I think you'll start to make a lot more sense to you. Okay? So, as you can see here, this is the, uh, the I have the first, uh, first edition hard copy. All right, if you buy it in paperback, it has a different, different cover. Same, same green color, but different, different because of like a, a woman on the cover. I don't know why. I don't, know, I don't know who she is. I don't, think she, I don't think she's meant to be in the story. But anyway, that's, uh, this is our, our second novel. Okay. So, let's begin with some context. Remembering that when we, we began the semester, we said, you know, when, when you take Peter's classes in literature, he has some three basic steps of how to approach the work of literature. And the first step was, even before you begin reading, was to think about the setting. The setting, the setting, the setting means where the, thing takes, where the story takes place. So the story takes place in the south of France, but no, that's not quite what we're after, a bit close. What do we look at? What do we think about? Because we haven't read any of it yet, right? Before we've even read any of it, what can we do? What can we learn about the text? About the author? Right. So what do we call this? This specific word that I said. Called the context. Right? So we have here our, our text, right? And we need to know about the context, right? Who is this author? Where is he from? When was this written? Right? All those kinds of questions. What is it influenced by? Right? Those kinds of things are all things that we don't need to read the text immediately for. We can look them up online. We can find out where they're from. We can see what else they've published. We can see their background. Right? We can see what influenced them, perhaps. Right? And certainly, um, yeah, what is on this? Uh, certainly from like, uh, some of the reviews that you can read and from the publication date, you can also tell some things about like, what influenced this novel. Right? So I'll tell you a little bit about um, this guy, Ian Pears. Right? And he is an English author. He lives in Oxford. Right? And uh, he has quite an interesting background. In the 1980s, he uh, did a, a PhD Right, so very high level study in art history. So in a lot of his novels, even if they're not about art, right, and we'll see this even in The Dream of Scipio, um, that he will talk about artists. He will talk about particular paintings. He'll make references to um, artistic movements um, in his work. Right? So uh, we'll see um, there are some very subtle allusions sometimes to famous paintings and, and famous moments in painting um, that he sort of fictionalizes and puts into his work as well. Um, so that's where he began. Began as uh, an art historian, got a PhD in that, and then he went to Yale University in America, 
and he did what's called a postdoctorate, which is like basically you spend a year or two being paid to work on your developing your ideas, and out of that he published a book about the, um, the emergence of the art market in England in the 17th, uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Right? Quite an interesting book. Right? Sounds dull, but actually quite interesting. And then in the 1990s, he worked as a journalist in France and in England, and uh, I believe he also did some TV producing, but then in the 1990s, he also began to write a series of detective novels, right? And they, again, used his background in art history. They were all detective novels about um, art heists, so stolen artworks, right? So they were sort of this mixture of, on the one hand, very like lowbrow genre, detective fiction, very popular kind of fiction, but at the same time mixing that with highbrow, um, you know, high art kind of stuff, right? So that's why I mentioned here that like this is sort of his, this novel is his second sort of real novel, right? His first, uh, his second re serious novel, right? So um, this, these series of, uh, of art mysteries, he, he wrote those. He says he wrote them for fun, but also for, for money. But then the irony was that when he published his first and very long and very big first serious novel, he actually made way more money out of that first novel than he did out of any of those um, ones that he wrote for entertainment. So that first novel was a, a murder mystery set in uh, 17th century England called An Instance of the Finger Post. Um, and then this is his second novel, right? And we'll talk about the, the structure and the style of this particular novel. Um, his third novel was called The Portrait, a short little one about a, a guy who takes, an artist who takes his revenge upon a critic that he used to be friends with and is no longer friends. Um, and then his, uh, his most recent novel is called Stones Fall, published in 2009. Um, and uh, that is about a, uh, a, a, a rich businessman, multi-billionaire, who uh, who dies in mysterious circumstances, and he goes back and he shows us like how he died and sort of solves the, the mysteries about his life. And he actually also does have another novel coming out fairly soon, um, and it's supposed to be quite innovative. It's called Arcadia, and he's like developed all sorts of like like phone apps and other other kinds of stuff to like expand the story in that particular in that particular book, but it's not out yet. Okay, so this is this particular novel is one of my absolute favorites. I, you know, I really like Atonement. It's up there, but this is like one of my absolute top novels, um, and I like it not because it's too easy. It's not too hard either, but because it really looks at some very interesting and profound ideas about how we relate to each other, how we as human beings, how we treat each other, how we love each other, how we. Uh, acts politically towards each other and ethically towards each other and really gets us to ask some very interesting questions, particularly about the topic of friendship, right? So who are your real friends? Who do you owe allegiance to? Who do you love the most? If you have to make a choice, a difficult choice between one loyalty and another loyalty, which do you choose? How do you decide, right? And these, of course, are things that the characters in the novel face and that we also sometimes in our life sometimes have to face these kinds of questions as well. Right? So they're very um, pertinent kinds of questions for us to examine. Okay. Now, as I said to you, um, you know, he has written some other books and they have different styles and different structures. His first novel, uh, his first serious novel, An Instance of the Finger Post, was, as I said, was a murder mystery. And the way in which he structured that was it had four separate accounts, right? So you read account number one, narrator number one, narrator number two, narrator number three, narrator number four, and then from that you put together the whole puzzle of what actually happened, right? And some of the narrators lie about you know, what they did and who they are and what their motivations are and all that sort of stuff, and you have to work it out. So, I know sometimes I've recommended this book to, to friends and they've read it and they say, well, well, why didn't he just put the three stories of these three main characters into three separate sections? And I said, well, he already did that in the last book, 
right? He's already tried that. He wants to do something new. He wants to do something different. But also it's because we're supposed to constantly compare what is happening in these three stories, right? Because these three characters, Manlius, Olivier, and Julian, they all make different choices, and they all end up with different outcomes. Some happy, some not so happy. Some good choices, some bad choices. Right? And so we're constantly meant to compare their decisions, their way of thinking, their logic, as they make these decisions and they face these crises. Right? So that's why part of why the story jumps back and forth between these different times and these different characters. Okay. So let's take a look at these, these characters. First of all, we have Manlius Hippomenes. Right? So when you pronounce his last name, right, you just pronounce every letter. hip pa ma -nes, right? Hippomenes. Right, so Manlius is a, is a Roman name, but Hippomenes is uh, a Greek in origin. Right? Hippo means something to do with horses. I don't know what Manes is. Right. So when is Manlius' story taking place? Well, it's taking place during the 5th century, so the 400s the late 400s, okay? So, you know, nearly, what, about 1,500 years ago, right, 1,500 years ago, roughly. And um, what is taking place around him, the crisis that he faces, is that the Roman Empire is in decline, right? And it's increasingly unable to resist the pressure and the the raids and the attacks from the barbarians, the various barbarians that are, um, in this case, attacking from the north. Right? So we'll see in the course of, of our story the way in which Manlius uses his political skills right, to try and find a way to live with these barbarians, right? to try and find some sort of peace with them, to so find some sort of way to not... To not uh, you know, be wiped out by them and to have the, his land taken over by them, right? But we'll see in the process he has to make some very difficult and sometimes quite awful decisions, right, in order to achieve those political goals. Right. Second, second character in terms of time, right, because of course we're in the, the actual narrative we're introduced to, to Julian first, and those of you who haven't started reading it, he dies. But he dies in the very first sentence of the of the novel, so I'm not revealing all that much. Okay, so the second character who is, um, who is uh, introduced to us in terms of time is that of Olivier, Olivier de Noyen. So those of you who can't speak French or have trouble with French pronunciation, this is roughly the Korean equivalent there, right? It's not quite that because the, the French have a very nasally sort of, so it's, Actually, it's noyen, uh, right? Noyen, you kind of go grunt through your nose, noyen, but noyen is pretty close. Okay. So Olivier de Noyen, who is a poet, right? And he is living in the Middle Ages. So he's living in the 14th century in this case, right? So we're jumping a thousand years ahead from Manlius, roughly. Right? So from the late 400s to the mid uh, 1300s, right? So not quite a thousand years, but you know, 900, close enough. Right? So the crisis that strikes Olivier during his time, as we'll see, it hasn't happened yet, but we'll see it happens later in the novel, and it should be no surprise given that like, everyone knows about this famous event, um, is that of the Black Death, right? And so if you've heard of this event, it's a very, um, it was a very deadly spread of the bubonic plague throughout Europe, and it killed approximately a third of the entire population of Europe um, during the middle of the, the 14th century. Right? So you can, you can imagine that it's just like a huge number of people, millions of people that died from, uh, from this plague. So Olivier, again, he has all sorts of political and personal um, dilemmas that he has to face, 
in terms of his friendship. Does he follow his boss? Does he follow his friend? Does he follow his lover? Right? Which of those is he loyal to? Okay. And then lastly, the, the one that is closest to us in time is that of Julien Barneuve. Right? This is the, the French spelling of Julien. Right? In English, it's usually with an A. In French, it's with an E. And again, like, like Noyen, right? Noyen, it's actually Julien, right? But we will, we can, we can anglicize it a little bit. So Julien Barneuve and the, uh, the big crises events that he faces. First of all, he, he fights in World War I, but he does survive that. But the big crisis that we see, of course, in the opening line is, right, what year, what, in fact, what date is it, Jungmin? What does it tell us? What is the date on that day when he dies? August 19. 1943. What's happening during that year? World War II. Yeah. Right. So he dies in the middle of World War II. Right. In this case, not by uh, by fighting, but by killing himself. Right. As we see in a fire. Right. So, um, again, Julia has to also make some tough choices between friendship and between his lover in this case. Right. So these are the three narratives, the three threads of the story. As you are reading, you'll see that Ian Pears jumps back and forth between them. Right? But there aren't any other surprises in terms of that. Like There's no other like fourth character that's going to jump in, or fifth character, or sixth character. There will be, of course, new characters that are introduced along the way, but they will all be in relation to these three characters. Right? So we'll see that Julian and Olivier and Manlius, they you know, make new friends, they have lovers, they make enemies and so on, but all of those are connected to that main thread of their own story. Okay. So if you look on the, if you see on the front of uh, our syllabus, I've also put this same picture and it's that a picture by the famous Renaissance artist Raphael. Right? And it too is called, sometimes, there are a couple of other different names for it, the Night's Dream. But one of the names for it is that of the Dream of Scipio. Right? Dream of Scipio. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a moment, who this Scipio guy is. Um, but first of all, what we see here is that this painting is meant to be an allegory or representation of that ethical dilemma that I just mentioned, right? Anyone? Obviously, this is the guy that's having the dream, right? Are these figures meant to be real? They're not. They're not real. They're figures in his dream and they are meant to represent something. What does it seem to represent? Anyone want to take a guess? I mean, look what she's holding. What, what's she holding there? It's a book, yes. The book of law. And in the other hand, what is that in the right hand? It's not tricky. It's a sword, yeah. Right? So, book of law in the one hand and a sword in the other, right? What do you think she might be representing? Right? Some kind of justice, or in this case, actually represents like the state, right? The, the, the country that you, or the state in which you are living, right? So, upholding the laws, but also like the, the military code. And then here on the other side, can you see what she's holding there? Anyone see that? It's a bunch of flowers. What do you think she might represent? Who would give you flowers? No one gets flowers? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you guys. 
especially you girls. You, you need to get on your boyfriends if you got one. What, what would, right? It would be love. Right? So here we see there is the the painter through this symbolism is portraying a particular dilemma, right? That this figure in the middle, he's having this dream, and it's about like whether he should owe allegiance to his country, follow his duty as like a soldier and a citizen, or should he follow his heart and care for his, his woman, his lover, right? So that's the dilemma. And of course, you know, when you're faced with this dilemma in a dream, that's pretty easy to choose, but when you have to face it in real life, that can be a much harder decision, right? It can lead to all sorts of heartache and you know, terrible um, you know, compromises that you have to make in the name of reality. We already saw a similar kind of dilemma, didn't we, with, with Robbie and, and, uh, and Cecilia in Atonement, right? So similar kind of dilemma that we see here. Okay, so um, this particular painting that we've just seen, the Raphael painting, and also the title of our novel are taken from somewhere else. They're taken from a, uh, an author that is mentioned in our reading for today, and that author is the Roman uh, philosopher, orator, all around loudmouth, really. Right? He, was, <laughs> he, was, he was kind of a big mouth, and he, uh, he eventually died because of it, actually. Um, was uh, a guy called Cicero, right? So um, Cicero wrote a, a lot, well, he wrote many things that have been lost, but one of his larger works was a, a, a book called De Republica, On the Republic, right? And um, in that book, uh, we only have like a few fragments of it that survive. And one of those fragments is called the dream of Scipio. Right. Now, those of you who are not up on your uh, your Roman history, right? Most people know about like the the Roman Empire, right? Who was the first emperor? Who was the first of those emperors? Very famous. The month of July is named after him. Julius Caesar. Yes. Right, so Julius Caesar is the first of the emperors, right? And, but before that, there was the Roman Republic. And remembering a republic is a country that does not have a king or queen or an emperor, right? So Korea isn't just Korea, it's the Republic of Korea. Do we have, do we have a king or queen or emperor? No, we don't. Who is the head of state? Who is the most powerful person? President, right? And the president is not royal, is not, doesn't inherit, it, inherit that title, instead is elected, right? So this is the Republic. And before the Roman Empire, for several hundred years, Rome was also a republic, right? So when it becomes the Roman Empire, when Julius Caesar comes into power, he actually changes that, right? It switches from being the Roman Republic to being the Roman Empire, okay? And the Roman Republic was a system that worked quite well for a long time, and it was also a system that sort of within Roman mythology was a system that produced great heroes, great men, right? And two of those, actually, went by the name of Scipio. One is the Scipio who has the dream, and then the other is his grandfather, Scipio Africanus. He's not his actual grandfather, he's his adopted grandfather. And, of course, he has died by the time he has this dream. And the younger Scipio dreams that he sees his grandfather, Scipio Africanus, in the dream. And Scipio Africanus being like in a dream, and because you can, do, you can fly and do whatever in, in a dream, he takes him up into the stars and they look down upon the world and his grandfather tells him, you must always do your duty to Rome, to the state, right? You must always be a good citizen. Right? So this is the central message of Cicero's 
Cicero's dream of Scipio, is you must be a good citizen. That's what it means to be virtuous. You must be like those heroes from the Roman Republic, right? from those great days of earlier Rome. Okay? Now, there's a bit of, as I said, there's a bit of irony in, in, uh, in Cicero's position because Cicero was one of the people who tried when, um, uh, when Julius Caesar and later, later Augustus um, were looking to uh, cement their position as emperor, and he wanted to support the, the, uh, the old republic, right? eventually led to him being killed, Cicero being killed, right? as, seen as a traitor to the empire. So uh, unfortunately for him, being a good citizen didn't, didn't work out all that well. He, <laughs> he ended up in his death. But nonetheless, this is the position that he advocates in that, that, uh, that essay or that story of the dream of Scipio. Now, the other main surviving fragment of that book is, as, and this is why it's pertinent to our, um, our novel as well, is a piece called Lilius, and it's a piece about friendship. Right? And in that, in that essay, which accompanies the dream of Scipio, um, Cicero argues that, well, First of all, just like Aristotle before him, he argues that you know, friendship is the highest, most important, most virtuous thing that you can do and be, right? That good friends are really rare, like true, really great good friends are very rare. Um, but also, again, following the theme of the dream of Scipio, that a good friend is also a good citizen, right? Now, again, you can see, if we think back to the painting for a moment, the Raphael painting, Right? Raphael presents those two alternatives, friendship or love, and your duty to the state as potentially being in conflict with each other, whereas Cicero has this idea that they could be in harmony with each other. Right? And this is one of the ideas that Ian Pears is going to explore throughout this novel. Right? Can you really be, have allegiance unbridled allegiance to your rulers, to the politics, to the public, and also be able to um, you know, follow your heart and, and care for those that you love as your friends and lovers and wives and, and husbands and so on, right, and family. Okay, so public, private, went to conflict. So for a long time, um, the, uh, the dream of Scipio as a text was actually lost. Um, we, uh, it, was, it was known by people like by Raphael who wouldn't have actually had a chance to read it through various commentaries that were made about, like so, sort of like a guide, guidebook to um, the Dream of Scipio. But the actual text for a long time was lost of the Dream of Scipio and it was only found in the 19th century um, when they, you know, they used to write on um, skins, animal skins. So they would stretch them out. You take a calf skin and stretch it out, and then you would write on it. Okay? And so it was, that kind of paper would be very expensive. right? So one of the things that they, that they started doing was um, they would recycle. So they would you know, take the, the calf skin, scratch off the ink, right? and then now we have a new blank piece of paper and we can write on it. And what they discovered in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the 19th century was a technique that allowed them as a kind of x-ray, right? Because you could sort of still see where the pen had pressed originally, so you could start to see what had been written underneath, right? What, so what had been scrubbed out suddenly became visible again. And so a whole lot of texts, including the Dream of Scipio, by Cicero were rediscovered in, in, in this way. Right? It's called a palimpsest. Right? palimpsest. Um, so this is a, a text that has both interesting ideas and even an interesting history on how it was lost and then rediscovered again. Okay. Okay. Now, one further potentially confusing matter that I said um, that I want to clarify for you is that we've just said that Cicero had his version of the dream of Scipio. Raphael has his painting, the dream of Scipio. 
But there is also a third fictional Dream of Scipio, and it's written by one of our characters, Manlius. Right? Of course, this, this document doesn't really exist, but it is described for us. We don't actually get to read it, but it's described for us in the course of the novel. Right? So he also writes a text called The Dream of Scipio. And so within our story, right, within our story, there are two texts known as The Dream of Scipio. There's Cicero's version and there's Manlius's version. And they are two quite different versions, two different sets of ideas, right? And of course, we're meant to compare them in the course of, um, of our reading, right? To see which one, which one fits, right? Which one is, um, oh, maybe, maybe both of them are wrong, but to examine their ideas through the, through the, uh, the window of the story, okay? So be aware of that, right? That there are, there's a real Dream of Scipio by Cicero, there's a real painting by, by Raphael, and in our story there is a fake, a fictional Dream of Scipio. And the reason that it survives in the, in the story is because it sometimes gets mistaken for being Cicero's. Oh yeah, it's just a copy of Cicero's um, Dream of Scipio, but actually it's Manlius' version. Okay. Now, one of the most, the trickiest and perhaps, you know, the, uh, the, uh, this is where you really need some context from me to understand some aspects of this novel, is a central idea in this novel known as Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism. Sounds like a big word, but actually if we break it down, it's quite simple. Neo means what? What, is, what, do we, what, what does that prefix neo mean in, in English? Something new. Right? It's not the same as what was there before, right? But it's a new version, right? A different permutation, different version of what had been there before, right? So if we think about, you know, we've talked previously, we talked about neoclassicism, right? As being copying the style of the Greeks and the Romans, right? In architecture in that case, right? But it wasn't exactly the same as the Greeks and the Romans. It was just a style that borrowed from their principles, their ideas, their styles. Right? So neoclassicism, and in this case, neoplatonism. So if we drop off the, the neo and the ism, who have we got left? Who's that? Plato, who is that? I, he, kind of, he, he was kind of a mathematician, like he does some mathematics in the Mino, but mostly he's a philosopher, yes. Right. So yes, he's a very famous Greek philosopher, one of the big three, right? Socrates, what books did Socrates write? That's a trick question, he didn't write any. Plato, <laughs> Plato who wrote about Socrates and used Socrates as his main character in his dialogues and then Aristotle, right? So those are the, the big three of ancient Greek philosophy, right? And so one of the ideas that Plato develops, particularly in his book known as The Republic, is that he argues, he makes an argument about the nature of reality, right? And he says, okay, now, our world, the things that we see around us are ultimately an illusion. They're fake, they're not real, right? And he says that actually the real ones are, you know, up in the heavens with the gods, right? They, it's like they have the blueprints. So if you want to look at anything in the universe, right? So here's a chair, right? And there are many different kinds of chairs, and there are many different chairs. But the gods up there have a blueprint of what a chair is, right? And that's the form of the chair, right? Similarly, there are many different human beings in the world. We all look different, right? We all have you know, different shapes and sizes and hair colors and all sorts of stuff like that. But ultimately, there is a form of a human being, 
right? The basic form that the gods design and that that is what real knowledge is knowing those forms, okay? So that's Plato's theory of the forms, but Neoplatonism is a bit more mystical than that, right? It's a bit more kind of, tends to be a little more religious in flavor, a little bit more mystical in flavor. And so you can see there's quite a big gap between when Plato is uh, writing his dialogues, writing his books, right? And Socrates is not writing his. Um, so, and then Neoplatonism, which comes some right, centuries later. Okay, so it's a kind of a revival of these ideas of Plato. And the ideas that the Neoplatonists have tend to focus less upon some of those like ideas about forms and instead to emphasize about how instead of having many forms like up there in the heavens, right, they argue that there is just one, right? Like one source of everything. And we are all, everything we are, everything that we see around us, right, is a fragment, a piece of that oneness. Now, you can probably you know, recognize in many other philosophies, right, very similar ideas. So Taoism, for example, from China has very similar kinds of ideas. That Yes, the world is multiple, but it's all part of the, the oneness of the Tao, right? So this is a very similar kind of idea in Neoplatonism, right? Is that there is just one form, one essence that is the source of everything and that creates the multiple things that we see around us. Right? Now, early on in Neo Neoplatonism, this idea of what that one is is extremely abstract. Right? It's just something, something unknowable. Right? It just creates everything as one. But, as you can imagine, this idea fits very nicely into the emerging Christian ideas. Right? So, Neoplatonist philosophers like St. Augustine say, oh, well, I'll take the Neoplatonist idea of the one, right? And surely the one is the same thing as, well, God, right? And so someone like St. Augustine blends those two ideas together, right? God is one, he's perfect, right? All together. And then everything that we see in the world is partial, fragmented, limited, and therefore not incomplete. And it's by its nature, right? So one of the things that happens here is that we have, and you can see this in the Manlius, particularly early on in the Manlius story, is the way in which um, a Greek and Roman tradition, which is a pagan tradition, not a, not a Christian tradition, blends together with a Christian tradition through figures like St. Augustine, right? So... Um, in this case, we have St. Augustine provides us with a Neoplatonic interpretation of Christianity. Right? He takes that idea of the one and the multiple that is central to Neoplatonism, and he applies it to, oh, the one is God. Right? The multiple is the world. And yeah, he applies these ideas. Now, one other important historical um, uh, manifestation of this Neoplatonic doctrine that's going to appear in our novel later on is a, um, a group, this group, known as the Cathars. Cathars, you can see how to spell it there. Catharism, the Cathars. And they were a, uh, a movement in the Middle Ages that uh, mostly focused in the south of France, right? And although they had some followers in like northern Italy as well. And this group, again, took those Neoplatonist ideas very seriously and combined them with Christian ideas in a much more radical, much more different sort of way. 
And what they argued was that our physic if, if Neoplatonism is right, right, and like all that we see around us is just you know, fragments, shadows, illusions of the multiple, and that God is the only real thing, right? The one is the only real thing. Well, then our bodies and what we see down here on Earth don't really matter, right? So these are just all an illusion, right? So if you're a man or a woman, right? Those differences are just, they're just illusory differences. It's our spirit that will eventually be joined with the one that actually matters, okay? So this is, this is their idea. So you can see that within that particular time period that this could have some very, very radical implications for the way in which their society worked, right? Imagine if you, if you start actually putting into practice, for example, this idea about men and women, you know, really our bodies are just illusions and therefore we're really just equal, we just each have a soul and the, all souls are the same. Suddenly, that removes the difference between genders, right? Which is a big part of you know, the historical power structure of most, pretty much all societies. Similarly, it also meant that the Cathars also had a different attitude towards death, right? Because it meant that you know, if this was just your body and it was a temporary sort of like resting place for your soul, well then you didn't fear death, right? If when you died, you just went back and you rejoined the one. Right? Your spirit just went back to God. Right? So the Cathars also had a very radical uh, attitude towards death in which they, kind of, they weren't scared of it. They weren't worried about it. Okay? So these ideas, uh, as I said, they gained a great deal of popularity in this part of the world, in the south, southern part of France. Um, and it's, uh, it's a part of the world that I'm, I'm particularly fascinated with. There's, you, if you go there, there's still like um, ruins and, and so on of Cathar castles, right? You can go and visit those, those areas. Um, and uh, um, in this, uh, this, this, this movement, however, was too radical for the Catholic Church. And they actually decided to uh, launch a crusade against the Cathars. And their decision was, we're going to kill these people. We're going to wipe them out. Right. So out of one of the, one of the I mean, here's a, here's a really pretty unchristian, very brutal thing to do, right? Well, unchristian in the theoretical sense. Unchristian, you know, in probably in the practical sense very often. But anyway... Um, we see what we see is like the, the the Catholic Church for 20 years went in there, slaughtered Cathars, persecuted them, refused to let them go back to their homes, and the movement was pretty much wiped out. Right? There's a famous saying that came out of this when uh, where they were attacking one particular city, and they asked the general. Well, how do, how do we know which ones are the Cathars and which ones are just Catholics? And he says, well, just kill them all and let God sort them out. Right? <laughs> pretty brutal. Pretty nasty. Right? So that's, that, that's a phrase that's entered into, um, you know, in, into sort of a proverbial language. Kill them all and let God sort them out. Also the title of the first Metallica album. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so these, these Cathars, remembering, look, look at the time period in which they are flourishing. This is also the time period of our story of Olivier, right? So at the time that he is living, right, the Cathars have been pretty much pushed underground or almost wiped out. But he still occasionally encounters some moments when he comes across Cathars, right? And he sees like what has been done to them and, and how this is uh, how they've been affected by these policies. Okay, so you can see in this picture, this is a uh, famous uh, picture of the the Catholic Crusaders rounding up and kicking the um, the uh, Cathars out of, of city um, in 
uh, southern France called uh, Béziers. Right? So you know, really, it's brutal, brutal time. And it lasted for 20 years, 20 years of just slaughtering and repression. Now, we're going to see that even though Neoplatonism has this idea of the one, right? Remember, the one is transcendent. It's beyond this world. It's like God, like it's out there, right? And the multiple is this world of illusions. We're going to see that um, Ian Pears himself plays a lot with this idea, right? That even trying to track down the one right, in these stories is sometimes either impossible or extremely complicated, um, or sometimes both, right? So, for example, one of the things that we, uh, we quickly learn about some of our characters is that the initial impressions that we're given of them are not what they actually appear to be, or actually what they were, right? So, uh, often Ian Pears gives us, like begins with giving us the impression of what Manlius was like, and then he gradually unravels the truth of what his character was like and who he really was. Olivier, similarly, right? Remember that Olivier's story is from the very beginning, right? Is very doubtful, right? Is open to, open to question. So um, here's, some, here's some examples of like the different versions, the different um, perspectives, just like in Atonement, that we get on some of these characters. So this first quote is from uh, page six in your packet. Is that right? Yes. And this is talking about how when Julian is research, because remember he's in the 20th century, and uh, Manlius is in the fifth century. So, you know. Uh, uh, Julian is this intellectual historian. He's researching like origins of Neoplatonism and these ideas, and he's researching Manlius. And he discovers that when he does his research, there are sort of like these two pictures, these two different conflicting versions of Manlius that start to pop up. That he's sort of like, wait, how can he be this guy and this guy at the same time? Right. So, to a scholar of Julian's generation. It almost seemed as though there were two Manlius Hippomenaeses. On the one hand, there was the bishop mentioned occasionally by the chroniclers, the miracle worker whose cult was still vaguely remembered, the man who converted the Jews of Vaison, whose shrine produced miracles long after his death, and who protected his people from the depredations of the barbarian invaders. Right? So this is one picture that we have. Right? He's this holy man, this bishop, he converted the Jews, right? he can, his, his body performed miracles. Right? So he's like this church figure on the one hand. On the other hand, there was the man of letters. Right? Remembering we talked about this use of the word letters as being a literary person, right? someone who is learned, who has read a lot of literature and philosophy and history and so on. Right? Man of letters who existed in the correspondence of his aristocratic friends and in the manuscript of the dream. Right? This is the dream of Scipio that he wrote. One was admired for his piety, right? his obedience to God or to the church. The other known for his sophistication and learning, his disdain for the vulgarity of the world, his aloof contempt for the age in which he lived. Right? So these two very different pictures of Manlius. Right? One religious, one a non-religious scholar, right? a learned guy from, of, of like the, the Greek and Roman tradition, the other a, a, a bishop. Julian's article, the one that brought him to the attention of the authorities in late 1940, sought to reconcile these two. So Julian is trying to, like he's trying to work out how could we have two such different pictures of the same guy? Can he really be the same person? These two, they just don't match, right? So he's wondering, how could this be possible? Okay. So this is one example that we see of the conflicting versions that we get of 
these characters. The second one is that of Olivier, right? And remember that when we're first introduced to Olivier, we're told this, this story like about you know, how he was this great poet and he fell in love and he died for love and all this sort of stuff. And then we're told, but it's probably not true, right? That's, this story is being recycled over and over and over again to the point where we have to be very skeptical about whether it actually is something that actually happened in Olivier's real life. So we're gonna go behind the scenes in this novel and see what actually happened in Olivier's life, All right? So here is Julien, in this case, he's reflecting upon this, the, the traditional version of, uh, of Olivier's story. He says, a touching tale attributed in different forms to many different people, All right? In other words, this story is like a formula, All right, that you know, has just been used over and over again. It's probably not really what happened in Olivier's life. It was Julien Barneuve who realized that it had originated with Olivier, then had been transferred to Petrarch um, when Olivier's reputation collapsed in disgrace and scandal later on. Uh, Petrarch is a very famous Italian poet, right? And he's sort of seen as the, the poet uh, in many ways who begins the Renaissance. Right? So uh, a very important figure. And actually, there's sort of a, a little bit of an in-joke here insofar as Ian Pears actually models Olivier's life on Petrarch. Right? So he's like, oh, yeah, this, this, this Olivier guy, he kind of reminds me of Petrarch. Right? They must have been confused, the two of them. OK. The anecdote then took on a life of its own and became part of the legend of the early Bach. Right? So the composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, right? A couple of centuries later, oh, wait a minute. This same story that's told about Olivier, that's told about Petrarch, is now being told about the composer Bach. Oh, that's kind of weird and kind of unrealistic that they would all have exactly the same story, right? So here is why he's, he's skeptical about it. Either early genius is encouraged with elders astounded and amazed by such infantile virtuosity, as is said to be the case with Giotto, famous early Renaissance painter, or Mozart, whom you should all know as a composer, um, or it causes alarm and the parents try in vain to block the torrent. Right? So in other words, he's saying these two are other versions right, of this like, sort of stereotyped story. Right? So either all of, everyone recognizes that they're a genius and everyone encourages them, or no one recognizes they're a genius and says, no, you can't become a, a painter or a musician or whatever it is, or a poet. And then he triumphs anyway and becomes, right, becomes that. Right? So these are, he says, these are like stories that are being told over and over again that are just kind of stock stories. They're not necessarily really true. None of the tales may be true. Well, they could be. Um, in fact, the stories are perhaps no more than a conventional way of signaling the birth of greatness, of the solitary purpose pursued throughout life. Right? So what Ian Pears is looking at here is that you know, in different times, there have been different standards for historical accuracy. Right? In our times, we expect that you know, if, we were if we're going to read a biography or a history, we expect it to, be, to try to be as close to the facts as possible. But different time periods have had, as I said, different standards for how they tell the story of someone's life. So in the medieval period, as we're seeing here, it's common to you know, change the facts and make it fit more nicely. Oh, yeah, 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 his, his father oppressed him. He wanted him to become a lawyer, but he really wanted to be a poet. You know, and then he struggled, and then he made it, right? You know? So it's sort of like the, it's almost like what Hollywood does to, to, to life stories, isn't it? Right? It's like, oh, the real story is a bit boring, so let's, let's jazz it up a bit. Like, let's make some more conflict, right? So this is, this is what historians used to do as well in the Middle Ages is that they had this tendency. And so then what that does is that we don't know then 
which is the real story and which, which is the enhanced or the changed or the modified story. There you can see Petrarch, the, uh, the poet, the Renaissance poet. So as I said um, earlier on, one of the repeated things that we're going to see in this novel is, just like we saw in Atonement, is these ethical dilemmas. And particularly more so in this novel, some political dilemmas, right? And we'll discuss the difference between those two um, as we go along, right? So how do, we, how do these characters, what kinds of choices do they make? And we see already in our first reading that there are these kinds of conflicts already starting to take shape. So look at Julian, for example, and his relationship to his parents, right? His father, on the one hand, scientific, rationalist, pushes his son to like, be the same way, not to go to church, not to, you know, not to follow religion. And then his father, sorry, his mother, pulls him in the opposite direction. She wants him to go to church. She wants him to be religious. And of course, this creates this sort of like unspoken war in their household of trying to win over like Julian. Eventually we see he sides emotionally with his mother. Secondly, we see a similar conflict with Olivier, right? Remember his father wants him to become a lawyer from the moment that he's born, from the moment he's conceived actually, <laughs> we're told in the novel, right? And, um, and then he of course discovers as he's studying with, uh, with the, the, the bishop. By the way, his name is pronounced not Sekani, but Chetani, right? Chetani, right? Chetani, in, in Italian, those two C's are Ch sound, Chetani. Okay, so, um, yes, this conflict, and then also, of course, Manlius, this is, a, this is something that is going to, as we said, remember we said that there'll be conflict between his political decisions and his friendships, right? And we see that in these quotes that Felix and his family are his closest friends, right? So we can see in that first quote, they've been together as friends for 20 years. They have, you know, they're obviously really comfortable with each other. They, there's moments when, like, you know, it says that, like, they're so comfortable, they don't need to speak, they know what the other is thinking. So, um, you know, this relationship between Felix and Manlius is a very close one. Manlius has this conversation that has a lot of ironic, ironic echoes later on, where they they're discussing the nature of civilization. And Manlius turns to Felix and he says, we are the civilized world, you and I. We're, we're civilized, like those, those guys out there, they're the barbarians, right? They're the ones who don't follow the rules. They're the ones who don't have any ethics. They're the ones who don't you know, have any morality, right? We're the ones who are like the good guys. We're the civilized. So he goes on to say, a few dozen people with our learning. It's our learning, it's our knowledge, it's our sophistication that supposedly makes them civilized. As long as we continue to stroll through my garden arm in arm, civilization will be continued. Right. So remember these words later on in the novel because, as we said, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be moments when Manlius is faced with difficult decisions between his political decisions and between his friendship, particularly with, with Felix, but also later on another character by the name of Sophia. So we'll see in these, these moments come back to haunt the rest of the novel as well. And then we can see also that you know, he really does, like this is not a fake friendship. Like He really does love Felix like he's his, you know, his best friend, his brother, like someone that he he truly loves and cares about. Okay. Now, my final point today, I know I've gone longer because it's introduction this time, 
um, is that uh, one of the other things that we see in this novel is that we repeatedly have um, ideas that get recycled in the novel in new ways. Um, and very often, they are ways that were not intended by their original author or by their original creator, but have become something new and often unexpected and sometimes even the very opposite of what they were supposed to mean in the first place. Right? So you think about our, our example of like, you know, the, the unchristian behavior. Of course, you know, Christ is supposed to be like a, a peaceful figure, right? And the Sermon on the Mount is, you know, Blessed are the peacemakers, and turn the other cheek, and all those other like statements like that. And yet, right, we see that the, in the Albigensian crusade against the Cathars, they <laughs> go out and kill a bunch of people in the name of the same person, right, who's preaching peace and love and forgiveness. So think about this too in regard to, to Plato. The, the Neoplatonists, they don't do the opposite of what Plato says, but they take his ideas and they reinterpret them in a new and different way that Plato would not have all, at all recognized, right? He would, not, he, he would have looked at the ideas of the Neoplatonists. What are you guys talking about? This isn't what I said. This is not my ideas. And similarly, then we think about how then St. Augustine appropriates those ideas to Christianity, right? So then Christianity reappropriates the, the Neoplatonist ideas. So the original Neoplatonists would be saying, what? This isn't what we meant. This, is, this, this Christian interpretation is, is weird. Right? So there is constantly throughout this book, we're going to see that there are things from the past that get recycled right? or become old ideas that become new again. But they're often misunderstood misrecognized, used, used in new ways, used in ways that would never have been expected. Right. So here are some examples just from our reading today. Right? A number of different ones. First of all, we have Manlius. Remember, he is believed by everyone to be this godly bishop. And then when he dies, right, his friends go into his home and they're like, oh, what? He has these these naughty statues and these, these banned books, let's, let's burn them, let's smash them, right? And even when they're sorting through, oh, well, maybe I guess we can keep this book and this book, right? Some of the books that they let slip through are also kind of naughty, but they, uh, but they let them, uh, they, but they misrecognize them as being like good Christian books, good religious books. Secondly, Second example we see is we have, of course, two fires that <laughs> Julian starts um, in the course of, uh, of this first few pages. One is the fire in which he burns all of, his, all of his life's achievements, all of his papers, and kills himself at the beginning of the novel. And we also see a few pages later that after he comes back from World War I, he's so disillusioned with what happened in that war that he takes all of his medals and all of his achievements and he also burns those in a bonfire as well, right? So there is this repeated theme here, right, of, um, of this burning. I'll, let, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this a little more in a moment, that, but it's quite important. Um, secondly, we also have the misreading of Olivier's biography and his poetry. We've seen like his his story is being blurred with that of Petrarch and other people, right? And of course, that means that, um, as we'll see, like the, the lines that from, from Olivier's poetry that are quoted in our story are also misinterpreted, right? They're not about Isabelle de Frejoux. They're not about this, this woman that everyone believes that he's in love with, right? They're actually about someone else and about something else. But they have been misinterpreted because this story has been overlaid onto his biography. Um, as I said, the fire with Julian's suicide reflects his earlier fire after World War I. We've seen also Cicero's writings, right? Remember when um, 
you know, uh, Olivier is sent out to buy the sweetmeats, and he ends up finding that like the the wrapping paper is like ripped out <laughs> copies of like a, a book, and it turns out to be from Cicero, right? And of course, what does his father do with those pages? Because remember, his father is not impressed that he's reading this stuff that's not law. What does he do with them? Well, he throws them in the fire. Right? Okay. And then we also see the symbol of the, the phoenix. Right? Remember, phoenix is a, uh, a mythical bird from Egyptian mythology. And the idea is that like, the phoenix lives its life, it dies, its body is burnt, and from out of the ashes arises a new phoenix. Right? So it's this symbol of death and then rebirth, continual cycle right? that is part of that, that mythology. Now, these are, these are all important, as you see that almost all of them involve burning, right? A kind of purification, a starting over, right? A new sort of blank slate that is provided by, and as well as an ending that is provided by the fire, right? But also, what it's also meant to symbolize, almost certainly, in Ian Pear's case, is that he's referring back to a famous event that happened in the ancient world. And that is the two disastrous events for learning that are mentioned, uh, that, that are in the background here. One is mentioned during our reading, and that's the closing of Plato's Academy. Right? So remember, Plato, who we talked about, is the founder of what was known as the Academy, like the first university. And in the sixth century, the Emperor Julian closed it. Right? He decided, no. Nope, done, finished. And it's seen as symbolically beginning the, the dark ages in Europe, right? No learning, no progress, no science, just a time of, of chaos, darkness, and so on. But the other one is the famous burning of the library in Alexandria, right? Alexandria is in Egypt, and it was the central repository for all of the learning of the ancient world, right? So, you know, thousands of manuscripts, thousands of books, thousands of scrolls were housed in the library at Alexandria. So when it burned down, right, you can imagine huge amounts of all that great classical knowledge, thousands of plays and poems and um, philosophy and science and all sorts of things were lost in that fire, right? And so there is sort of a, a, a terrible double feeling. On the one hand, it's terrible insofar as, right, you've lost all this knowledge, you've lost all this history, you've lost all this connection back to the ancient world. But also, it represents a chance to start over, doesn't it? it represents something new that you can create out of those ashes, like the phoenix. All right, so hold on to your prep sheets um, and add to them for next time because uh, when we come back here next time, we will discuss, uh, in, since some of you haven't had a chance to read it yet, we'll discuss all of the, the pages for this week, right? So when we come back, we'll discuss up to, I think it's page 35, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Okay, thanks guys. I'll see you then.